Okay. All right, can you people hear me? All right, okay, fantastic. Um, today I'm presenting um, everything around GSM. And I'll start with explaining GSM a little bit. And then we start focusing on the security of GSM. And later on I'll introduce some device that you can use to receive GSM traffic. And ultimately I will tell you how you can crack GSM traffic, receive and crack, and hopefully listen to it. Um, and then I'll try to get you excited in joining our project. Um, first of all, project is public. <coughs> our project is public, and um, everyone is welcome to join. We have a wiki online where you can read what we are doing, and um, it's a whole group behind this. I'm just presenting it, okay? So it was not everything was not engineered by myself. And um, ultimately, yeah, I would like to get you excited and get you join us, our effort. Okay, um, let me start. <coughs> First off, um, why are we doing this? We are doing this because no one else is doing this. This is always a good reason. If no one else is doing it, it's probably hard because no one else has done it. And we like doing hard things. We like doing things that no one else has done. Um, we also do this because probably companies wouldn't like this. The mobile operator wouldn't like this if other people could intercept their traffic. And that's usually a good motivation as well. If a big company doesn't like it, there's always something to get. And um, also, I'm very happy to, to, to give this talk in Austria because if you've heard in Germany, there's some new laws that make this kind of talk and this kind of speech very dangerous to do and very, very problematic. Because in Germany they decided instead, um, instead being able to look at the problem and talk about the problem, they decided you're no longer allowed to look at this problem and the companies get away with having faulty security and ultimately you suffer from this. So I'm very happy to be here and give this talk in Austria, um, which is always a nice thing. Okay, let's start. First slide. Well, we talked about this already. Let's talk a little bit about GSM. GSM is the largest mobile network. There are over two billion subscribers on GSM. This is two billion, okay? This is, I think that might be more subscribers on GSM than people have running water at home. So it's a lot of people on there. Let's talk about the GSM network. Very complicated map. It will get easier in a minute, but ultimately what you have on the left side is a mobile phone. Everyone has a mobile phone. The mobile phone talks to the base station. This is the air interface. And then it goes into the normal landline, um, landlines to the central database. And you see a lot of interesting things here. You see um, AUC, which holds all your key information. You see routers and base station concentrators and all this. So what you have to realize is that your mobile phone is like a network plug. It's a network plug into the mobile operator's network. And with this network plug, you can do more things than just doing phone calls. You can query the database, you can retrieve location information, you can change location information, you can change location information of other people. You can do a lot of funny things, but we get to that more later. Um, and because it's an air interface, it's more or less like the old times when you had hops instead of switches. You hear everything. Whatever this person over there, over there receives, you receive as well. It's a broadcast, okay? The radius of a GSM mobile phone is up to 30 kilometers. And this is 30 meters, kilometers radius. So the, in both directions, 30 kilometers. So if you have a good receiver, ideally, you can receive from 30 meters this direction, 30 meters this direction. That's very, very long. I mean, 30, meter, 30 kilometers, you're already in the next town from here, okay? It's very, very long. Um, I'll talk later about uh, why this is reduced and practically not possible. But this is receiving. This is when other mobile phones are transmitting. Obviously, you can transmit to the moon if you like. You only need an amplifier. You know, if you amplify a lot, you can transmit to the moon. You can tell a base station in Rome from here that you are now in Rome, okay? I mean, it only depends how much power you put in. <laughs> okay, ultimately base stations are clustered into little cells and they don't overlap these frequencies. But this is just to give you an idea. Each cell is maximum of 30 kilometers. In city centers, they are much more reduced. And you will see this in a minute. Why? This is a picture of a base station. You, seen the, you see them when you walk around. You see them on the rooftops. And usually they go into three directions. Each is a directional antenna of 120 degree angle. So they have three antennas um, per, per, per base station. And this picture taken in the UK, there's a base station in here as well. 
okay, there's a base station in this tree. It's a 100% artificial tree. They are doing this in the UK because people start complaining about the massive amount of base station in the garden. <laughs> so, well, I don't know. Okay, let's, let me talk a little bit about phone. How does the phone work? And um, our first approaches. Um, a phone these days consists of two processors. And um, a phone is an amazing device. It's a very fast processor. It's 200, sometimes 300 megahertz, 32-bit ARM architecture, okay? So you can do a lot of stuff with it. They do a lot of processing. And they come with two processors. They come with a baseband processor, which does all the GSM networking stack. And they come with the application processor. The application processor is usually what you see. You know, it's your calendar and your SMS and all the fancy stuff. And the baseband is just a pure stack. Okay, our first approach. We wanted to receive GSM signals. So we looked on the internet and see what's there. And what we found is that there's a Nokia phone, and this is a lot of phones from the Nokia DCT3 series. We choose the 3310 um, that was shipped for two years with D-Box symbols enabled. So Nokia shipped this phone with D-Box symbols in the phone between 2000 and 2003. So all these phones have debug symbols, and you can exploit these debug symbols. You can, make, you can have fun with them. You can turn your, t your mobile into a trace mobile. So connect it to a PC, you configure it in a special way, and all of a sudden, you receive all traffic that is sent from the base station. All traffic, okay? So you see, for example, traffic that is sent to your friend on the, on the beacon channel, on the broadcast channel. And you can analyze this with a PC, and this helped us a lot. Um, I bought my phone from, uh, for one euro on eBay, and the shipping cost 12 euro. So it was, shipping was more than the phone itself. Um, then there are other um, ideas how we thought, okay, how can we intercept traffic? Texas Instrument, who's the world leader in um, these um, OMAP chips for receiving GS, uh, for processing GSM signals, um, they have target boards and development boards, which are rather expensive, 2,000, 3,000 US dollars, and they are rather hard to get to. But you can program these boards, there's Linux running on there, and you can get access to the baseband chip and you can access to the traffic that is coming to you, and you can also send your own traffic. Then there's a company called Picochip. Um, they are doing base stations for PicoCells, for little companies who want to put up their own base station in their own room, in their own office. And they are software-based, and they are having um, development boards as well, so you can use these as well. And then there's wireless 3G for free. And there's another company who has 100% software implementation of a base station running on real-time uh, Red Hat. And um, yeah, you can modify it and start sending and receiving information. But we decided to use the USRP. The USRP is the Universal Software Radio Peripheral. It was developed by Matt Etters, and he released, I think, three or four years ago. And it's a device that can receive any kind of traffic from zero to five gigahertz, any kind of frequency. And it's 100% software driven. You connect it with a USB cable to your computer, and you receive the signals, you define um, the, the frequency you want to tune in, you define the bandwidth, and all of a sudden you receive all the IQ signals and you do all the demodulation on your computer. And there's uh, a new project, a new radio project, who wrote a lot of tools and a lot of blocks to process this data. And we are using the same thing. Now, let's go into GSM signaling. GSM signaling works on different frequency bands and depends where you are, if you're in America or in Europe. But um, a famous one in Europe is the GSM uh, 1800 uh, megahertz band. And a GSM phone is either sending or receiving. It's never doing the same thing at the same time. Okay, this makes our design much simpler because we either have to concentrate on sending traffic or we can swap on, on transmitting traffic. We don't have to deal with both at the same time. And sending and receiving, it's also separated um, by on, on, on a different band. They're 25 megahertz apart. So we can tune when we're on one certain frequency, we know on this frequency there's only traffic from the base station, and when we're on a different frequency, we know from this frequency there's only traffic to a base station. Okay, the USRP costs 900 US dollars, okay? It's not expensive. And considering the euro at the moment, <laughs> it's really cheap. <laughs> Um, at the limitation of GSM, and then I also explain why 30 kilometers is not really possible. The um, limitation of GSM is that at a maximum, a thousand people at the same time can do a phone call. If there are more thousand people, the frequency band can't handle it. Okay? So what they do, 
um, obviously there are more people at the same time now in Vienna doing, doing phone calls. There are more than a thousand people. Um, so what they do, they make these cells smaller and smaller. They make them two kilometers small. They limit the transmitting rate. And then in a two kilometer cluster, a thousand people can do a phone call. So if a thousand people in a stadium, they all do at the same time a phone call, the network is jammed and you get the same as network busy um, thing on your mobile phone. Maybe one of you had it already. That's a limitation. Okay, I talked about this already. It's either sending or receiving. Um, the beacon channel. The beacon channel is a broadcast channel. The first thing your mobile phone does, it listens for all messages sent to everyone. It's like on a network sending to everyone. It's there as well. It's sent to everyone. Everyone analyzes it. And at some point, um, the, the base station says, I want to speak to this specific mobile phone. And then the mobile phone says, OK, this is me. What do you want? And the, mo and the base station says, yeah, I would like to send you an SMS. Why don't you go, why don't you go on a different channel? And then all the communication happens on a different channel. But everything that is sent over the beacon channel, you receive as well with the Nokia phone, okay? So you receive, for example, information. This mobile, um, mobile subscriber just entered your cloud. You're receiving cloud. Or this mobile subscriber just left your um, cloud. This mobile, this mobile subscriber just is at the train station or somewhere else. Um, you see whenever someone initiates a call, whenever someone receives a call, when someone sends a text, receives a text. You see the kind of encryption that they're using. And all this kind of meta information you get for free, unencrypted. Um, okay, some more facts. One burst allows 156.25 bit. Um, if you're a computer scientist, you start vomiting when you read a quarter bit. Uh, but when you're, when you're an RF engineer, you say, okay, it doesn't really matter. Um, and really, it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, that's enough of the facts. This is an example output of the Nokia Trace Handy. So what we did, we connected the Nokia Trace Handy and uh, we sniffed or traced the traffic received by the mobile phone while receiving a text message. And this is a good example how you can see what, what's going on, what's happening on the beacon channel. What you see here is the base station asking for any kind of mobile phone with this specific temporary uh, mobile subscription identification to respond if it's there. So hello mobile phone, are you there? And then the mobile phone, and then the base station says, okay, um, I would like to do something with you, please go on a separate channel. And it assigns a separate channel. All this information is public. It assigns a separate channel. It tells the mobile station the, the channel hopping frequency and the channel hopping algorithm to use. And all this is all public, OK? The next message that sends, OK, who are you anyway? And it says, yeah, my type of identity is IMSI. I would like to get your IMSI, your, in, your uh, mobile su subscription identification. And he says, OK, this is my IMSI. The mobile phone responds with the IMSI. And this is something fascinating, because if you read the GSM standards, it says the IMSI should never be transmitted over the network. OK? So this was the first trace that we did. The first trace. And what we see is the IMSI being transmitted over the network. So this gave us hope. We, we just started with GSM. OK? We started with GSM this year, in 2007. This was the first program we ran. And, and what we see is already more shit coming out of this. OK? So, well, great. Let's continue. I told you the cipher to use. Um, the base station says, OK, A5 slash 2 is available, which is the weak encryption, and also A5 slash 1 is available. The mobile phone should use a stronger one, OK? Uh, it might not always do so, but it should. The base station sends a random number to the uh, mobile station, and the mobile station will encrypt this random number, generate an address, and then send this address back to the base station. The base station can then verify that this is really the the, the, the authentic subscriber he wants to talk to. So address is sent back. All oh, this is clear text, okay? And then the base station says, okay, let's start ciphering, but please also include your email. This is not just the subscription identification. This is now also your equipment identification. And obviously that's signed in clear text as well, including the software version. So um, everyone basically knows what kind of phone you're using. Also something that shouldn't be clear text on the network. OK, let's see. GSM security. You know this picture? GSM network. Now, there are certain ways how you can attack a GSM network. 
how you can intercept traffic. Obviously, the most obvious way is um, you have the queue already. Okay, easy to do. We don't talk about this. Another way is you just go to the base station. Only the interface is encrypted. As soon as it hits the base station, it's all clear text. It's sent over clear text, digital lines, throughout the network. So someone with access to the base station, and they are qu quite easy to access. They look out of the window. You know, some roofs go up, padlock in, can read it. And there's an official interface, there's a monitor port, there's a switch where you take your laptop, plug in your laptop, use a certain kind of software, and you can intercept all traffic received from this base station in clear text, including voice, everything, okay? So there's no end-to-end -end security on GSM. And that's, this is how far GSM security goes. Okay, this is the network, this is where it is secure. And, uh, well, this was broken. This was broken in 98 already. Um, Shamir and other researchers broke this in 98. But what they broke is a theoretical attack. They still required, I think the best attack right now requires 90, um, 90 seconds of traffic. But that wasn't good enough for us. We wanted to, 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 to crack anything. We wanted to crack any kind of SMS message that only lasts a couple of milliseconds. And in the end, I mean, most people, most phone calls, over 90% of all phone calls last, are shorter than 90, 90 seconds. So this attack was, okay, in theory, GSM had broken, but practically no one can still break it. So we want to do the practical thing. Okay, about the standards. It all started with A5-1, the strong encryption algorithm. Now, when GSM started in the 80s, they were so excited about it that um, it had encryption, because the US, they didn't have any encryption, um, that they thought, oh, this is far too strong, and we can't give it to the Russians, and we can't give it to the Middle East, so we better invent A5-2, which we can crack, and um, then we can use it, and we can give it to them and sell it to them. And obviously, A5-2 was cracked in a minute, and you can real-time just use your computer to, to intercept the traffic. Um, for a long time in France, there was A5-2 was used, so that the government can sniff on their own people. But that's not true anymore. That's still a myth that they're still using A5-2. We verified this with the trace mobile. They are using A5-1, which doesn't make a big difference, because we're breaking it as well. Okay, another attack vector is um, be aware. Your mobile operator knows your key. Okay, this is not your private key. There's no private public key authentication. This is a static shared secret generated by the mobile operator given to you on the SIM card. So somewhere the mobile operator has a database which contains all the keys of all the subscribers. Anyone with access to this database can decrypt your traffic. Anyone with access to your SIM card can decrypt your traffic without having to retrieve the key from the SIM card. How it works, the SIM card has an interface where you can tell the SIM card, this is the random that you just received, and this is the GSM packet. Um, generate the key material, keep it secret, don't tell me what you generate, but just decrypt this packet. Okay? So with access to the SIM card, everyone can decrypt past conversation happened. So if today, for example, you do a conversation on a mobile phone, and you throw your mobile phone away and your SIM card away, and someone in two years takes your mobile phone out of the bin, he can decrypt all conversation you had in the past. Okay. Okay. Let's see how A5-1 works. Let me check the time, how we're doing. Perfect. Okay. This is a shift register, A5-1. I'm not bothering with you explaining A5-2 because they're all coming from the same idea. It's a shift register of 64 bits. And what happens is you have your key, which is 64 bits, I'll come to that later, it's 64 bits, and it's fed into the shift registers and they are clocked. You see three registers, R1, R2, R3. And you see these dark registers, these are tap registers. Uh, sorry, these are clocking registers. And yeah? Don't get scared, okay. I'm just not sure how to do this yet. We learn and we know. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, so you have these clocking registers, and the clocking registers decide when to shift 
each register to the left or to the right. So let's assume all the registers are filled with some zeros and ones. And um, you want to clock it for one cycle to receive one bit of output. So the C1, C3, C, C2 determine, uh, determine which registers is shift, and this then depends which bits falls off at the end and is used for the output stream. Okay, so it's fairly simple, and it's fed back to the beginning again. There's no new input, it's just always fed back and comes in. And you see these different errors here. This means that these bits are XORed as well and put back in at the beginning. So see these registers? The top register is 19 bit long, 22 bits, and 23 bit, giving you a 64 bit key state. And uh, well, one obvious attack is when you know the output stream, and you know the output stream because you're intercepting the traffic, and you set R1 and R2, you guess R1 and R2, you can calculate R3. Okay, this is an obvious attack. And the complexity roughly is 2 to the power of 42, which still means it requires you a couple of hours on an FPGA cluster. Not good enough for us. Not good enough. We want to be better than that. Okay, A5 slash 1 encrypts per each frame. Each frame that is sent is encrypted under a different key state. And the algorithm generates 114 bit of cipher stream, which is then XORed with the plain text, giving you the cipher text. Okay, so the result is the cipher text. And uh, to understand, when you read the academic paper from Shomi and other people, they say, yeah, you need 90, 90, 90 seconds, but you also need to know the plain text. You, it's a plain text attack, it's a known plain text attack. You have to know the plain text. And they say, yeah, you can guess the plain text. You can maybe assume that each person in the beginning of the conversation says, hello. Or you can assume that only one of the person is speaking at the same time. So it gets really rather complicated. I mean, it's a theoretical attack, not a practical attack. But there's something much easier what they didn't know. We are coming from the GSM. We are not coming from the crypto community. We are coming from the GSM community. And we know that every GSM message is padded. It has to be 23 bytes long, 23 octets. So each message, if, it's, if you can't fit enough data in there, is padded with a fixed byte, OX2B. Okay, so, yeah, so we have a lot of known plain text. And in fact, the first message that sends is almost everything is padded except three octets. And also these three octets are always the same. So the first message, we have always known plain text. And our attack only needs the first message and we can crack. More to that later. Oh yeah, I said that already. Um, okay, our attack, we use a combination of rainbow table attack and others. So some of you might have heard of rainbow tables. Um, if you come from the academic field, they're more known as CMTO, time memory trade-off attacks. And they were invented by, by Hellman in the 80s. And to give you a different a kind of understanding of what they're doing is, let's go back to this one. You have a certain state, and this state generates 64 bit of output. Let's assume it only generates 64, not 114 bit. And what would happen if you take this output again? and use the output as a state and generate another 64-bit. And you take again the output as a state and generate another 64-bit. And you do it a couple of million of times until you hit a distinguished point. For example, until the first 20 bits output are, are zero. Okay? Then you have a start. You start it with a fixed state. You go round, around, 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 around until an endpoint. Now what happens if when you sniff a cipher stream, you do the same with the cipher stream. You take the cipher stream, use it as an input again, and you do it as long, as long, as long, until you have hit this distinguished point, until the first 20 bits are zero of the output. And then you know, probably, hopefully, that when you start again with the original start point, and you do this again, 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 you will hit exactly the state. You will hit the output. Okay, and this is called uh, time memory trade-off attacks. And this is basically what, what we are doing. And we are modifying a little bit to, to work better on GSM. And um, A5 has a lot of collisions, so we had to get around this problem. Um, ultimately, last year, uh, six months ago, we thought we can do it on five terabyte, and we would require four hours for one session. Now we have optimized this. We can do it on two terabyte, and we only need one hour for one session. And the complexity um, is two to the power of 30. So the first attack that I explained, the Rowan Anderson attack, where you guess one of the registers, was 2 to the power of 24, uh, 42, and we broke it down with a TMTO attack to 2 to the power of 30, which is good. Now, okay, let's go back to the TMTO attack. 
<coughs> the simplest thing with the TMTO attack, or to attack this, is you would take a state, you would generate 64 bit of output, and you have the output. And you save these tuples. So you save, always save the start state and the output. Start state, output. So you would ultimately have to store 2 to the power of 64 um, tuples of each 128 bit long, which is quite a lot of data, and you can't really do it. And it's also quite a lot of processing power, because you have to do this 2 to the power of 64. Now, this is a stream cipher. And this, is, this helps us a lot, because as I said earlier, you generate the output, and you check your cipher stream if you hit this output. But because you have 114 bits, you don't just do this from bit 0 to bit 63, you also do this from bit 1 to bit 64, and from bit 2 to bit 65. So you can do this 50 times. And because you have four, um, four GSM frames, you can do it 100 times. So this brings down our pre-computation time um, dramatically. We don't have to pre-compute 2 to the power of 64 um, and records, we only have to pre-compute well, far less, 2 to the power of 50-something, 50, 50 uh, which is great, because then we can do it on an FPGA cluster in 60 days. And this is only the pre-computation. TM2 is always done in the pre-computation phase, where you generate these tables, and in the online phase. And the online phase is the actual attack, where you, where you use the table to look up the, the, the values. And the online phase for the um, demo buster will take um, yeah, one hour in total. Now, we thought, okay, that's quite good, um, but we also have a commercial solution available. It's the A5 Buster, and this will be available in 08. And uh, we target to get this attack done under 30 seconds with a 95% probability, and it will be using 28 terabytes and a couple of FPGAs. And this will be the real-time online phase attack. Um, the A5 demo attack, we probably release around the same day. We will make these tables public on the internet. We are hosting it on the an internet archive project. John Gilmer offered us this, and that's great because they, he said they have a couple of petabytes kicking around they're not using. So, yeah, we do that with them. Okay. Let's, let's think about the future. This is all nice and fine, we can crack GSM, but um, that's just a small thing. You can do more with GSM. You can do more when you have a new SRP. You can start sending. You can pretend being a base station. You can other people having logged into your computer and you forward their calls, which is exciting. You can generate your own baby cell. Imagine you have a conference and you just serve your own mobile network. Everyone can do phone calls for free. You're in the city, you give the entire city free mobile phone calls. I don't know, it's not really legal, but you know, uh, you could do it. Um, well, obviously, then the typical security assessment things you can do man in the middle attack, you can track people. Oh, tracking people is interesting. Um, people always assume to track someone you need three antennas and you do some kind of triangulation. That's not true. You can do it with one USRP. And that's great because the base station already gives you the information how far a mobile subscriber is, the distance from a mobile subscriber to a base station. So this is already known because you receive this information, you know where the base station is. You know the distance to your machine, you can triangulate them with just one receiver because you get a lot of information already. You get the phone numbers, you know, you can see, can get the phone numbers if interested in it. You can try to access the mobile operator database. You know, a typical, what can we do if we have access to the network? What, where, what's our next thing? What, what's a threat? What's a threat to the mobile operator? The threat to the mobile operator is that someone might take a look at the, back, at the database. Someone might send packets that were not supposed to be sent. Buffer overflows come to mines, denial of services, you, who knows? I don't. Well, obviously free calls, we talked about that. And the next big thing is GMTS, uh, UMTS and 3G. Femtocells and PicoCells are already selling target boards, so you can experiment with that network as well. And yeah, ultimately, join us, join our effort. Um, feel free, everything is open. The last thing that we are currently using for sending and receiving traffic is the OpenTSM, which was uh, a Spanish phone which um, the source code is on the internet, and you compile the firmware on your own. You have access to the DSP, you have access to the baseband processor, and yeah, you can do a lot of things, and the things cost around 40 euro or so, and it's maybe a cheaper solution than the USRP. Ultimately, the USRP is more powerful because you can do more things with it, but for an entry-level GSM, interceptor, sending, pirate, whatever, OpenTSM is a good choice. And uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. If there are any questions, please ask some questions. Um, 
I'm sure there was something not so clear. Um, please. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I missed it, but I think you didn't say anything about the security of SMS in this context. Yes, OK. SMS, it's defined in the um, E2 documents as it's optional and left to the operator to encrypt it or not. Um, so we thought, okay, usually when you leave something to the operator, you know, it's a disaster to happen. But actually, we checked in the UK and France, and SMS are actually encrypted. So it's good news. Ooh. Well, it's bad news that A5 is broken, but um, it's good news that they thought about encrypting them. So SMS are encrypted in most countries. It's the same encryption standard as A5 slash 1, exactly the same protocol handshake, um, the same security. Oh, I forgot to mention. Um, I mentioned that the key state is um, seeded with 64 bit of keys. This is not true. Um, the keys that are on your SIM cards are artificially weakened. The last 10 bit have been set to zero to make it easier to intercept your traffic. Okay. So SMS is sort of endangered in the same way as phone calls are. Exactly. In the past attack, um, Shamir couldn't crack it because they said they need 90 seconds, but we only need the first frame. So we can get SMS as well, because obviously SMS are very short. So does this open a window for um, sending out SMSs that pretend to be sent from another phone? Um, at the, I don't know. At the moment, what we can do, we can receive the SMS, and we can decrypt the SMS. It might be possible that you can also send. It's a field to research. Join us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. If I remember correctly, there are three linear feedback shift registers which are covered in a non-linear way. But um, still, there should be some um, linear equivalent. Yeah. And do you know about the messy Berlikamp algorithm? No, I don't. Perhaps we should talk you mean for so a bit. It's a very efficient method to reconstruct linear and yeah. linear feedback Yes. That's easier than to terabytes. Yeah, the, um, okay, let's talk about it. I know there's an attack where someone, um, it's, I think it's called the Goliath attack, where the Goliath attack, or Golik attack, where he generated um, 64 um, polynomes. Um, and if you solve all these polynomes, you can reverse the, the state. But the complexity is uh, far, higher, far higher than 2 to 30. But maybe if you have an idea, let's drink some beer and talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I understand everything. So if I have to buy this universal software right here and put it, uh, link it to my notebook, I yeah. need two terabytes of symbol for it stored on my notebook for the code. Okay, you buy this USRP from Matt Atlas and um, you pay custom tax on it when it arrives. And you connect it to your PC, you need the new radio software, you need our software on top of that, and then you can receive the encrypted data. Now, once you receive this encrypted data, you need two terabyte, which you can download from the internet in March 2008, and you need an FPGA card. You need an LX50 or Spartan 3 FPGA board, uh, which costs, I don't know, 200 US dollar, which does the online face cracking. And then you might be able to decrypt it. It's 95% probability. No, but it's not possible to do it in, in real time. Um, well, it takes, with the demo buster that we are releasing for free, it takes you one hour. With the commercial version, the A5 buster, it takes less than 30 seconds, which is as close as real time as you can get. I mean, you can always double, you can always double your hard drive space and half the time. Um, but 30 seconds should be good enough for me. How much will it cost? Uh, we don't know yet. We know the demo bus is for free. We don't know how much the commercial version is. I mean, hardware costs will be around, I think, uh, maybe 80,000. But we haven't decided yet. Let's say uh, you want to call somebody's phone call. Back in the day, on the AMS and NAMS network, you know, Mark Lauder had my software that did this. You put in a phone number and watch it move from cell to cell. And you can dump it all to a WAV file or process it later. So this. Do you just pick a frequency and you see just who comes along and you record it later on in the process? Or is there an, the public identifier of somebody's phone, you can just only record the encrypted traffic for, say, your target? 
and then post process later. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can crack it, but how do you gather it in an efficient fashion? Okay. Um, first thing that happens is that every mobile operator has a beacon channel. So if there are five mobile operators, T-Mobile, E+, I don't know, each of them is in a different frequency. So when you turn in your mobile, it search for its operator and locks in there and listens for all the traffic. Then the mobile operator, if you want to do a communication with the phone, says, okay, jump to this frequency and start exchanging data there. Now what we do with one USRP, we also jump on this frequency and we record the data. With one USRP at the moment, we can only follow one phone at the same time. Um, you can find out, um, you saw earlier in the trace that you have this temporary MSI and they were supposed to give you anonymity. But you've also seen that the EMI is anyway always transmitted and the EMI SV is also, and everything is basically transmitted. So you can target a specific guy. I mean, you can even find out the phone number. Right, until uh, they change self and you need another no, uh, you only need a Yagi antenna or better receiver. I mean, um, your mobile phone might only transmit for two kilometers to be received from the base station, but with a good antenna, I don't know, you can do it from eight kilometers or whatever, you know? It depends on the receiver. So there's no real difference in that between the whole analog base? No, it's just, not, uh, it's just digital, so it's a bit easier to intercept. <laughs> Uh, about what? Oh, the padding. Um, oh, I don't know. They could possibly change it, but why bother? No one complains. I mean, did any one of you complain that you are paying for the security and you never received it? People don't care, you know? That's a problem. Say again? Yeah, 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 possibly you would need to upgrade all the firmware on all the mobile phones, yeah. Maybe That's true. Um, apparently, uh, some mobile operators are doing this already, but um, I wouldn't hope for that. I think the big move is to uh, UMTS, 3G, and when that will happen. Obviously, all mobile phones that come right now with 3G also can be downgraded. Um, so you just send, you jam the other frequency band of 3G, and all of a sudden they all fall back to GSM, and then they're all insecure again. <laughs> the FPGA code will be free available. Um, it's very low code at the moment. And there's also a Unix C reference implementation, so if you want to port it to somewhere else, it should be fairly possible to do. Anyone else? Oh, yes, please. So I'm here from Canada. I've got a, a SIM card with a password that's built into the SIM I'm roaming over here on A1. How yeah. are the mobile operators sharing that information out of band? How they are sharing this information? The password on my SIM card. The, the password on your SIM is a local SIM card. It protects your SIM card. Period. Purely. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, I'm not aware that it goes over the network. Um, so from that, your four digit pin is good enough for the SIM maybe. So I wonder if there's speculation. Why would they need to pad all the information to make it simple to crack it? All they can do is get to that encrypted back end. I mean, if you're law enforcement, you can get access to all this legitimately. Why bother downgrading any of it? Because for the law enforcement, it's such a pain in the ass to get access to the VTS. I don't know why. But they artificially set all the things to zero. Maybe they pay, they bribed someone and the engineers of TSM and said, you know, you get 10,000, you set the last pin 10 bits to zero and have a happy holiday, and he did it. Yeah. But <laughs> it just doesn't make sense that you have the skeleton key anyway. That's right, and this is what we have to question, you know, why, why did they do this? Yeah, that's true. That's right, hmm, oh, foreign agencies, hmm. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Anyone else? Yeah, oh, yes, please. Yeah, there's one more question. What would prevent me from setting up um, fake base station here? Yeah. And um, by sending the strongest signal, yeah. getting all local phones to talk to me and then providing nothing. Nothing. Nothing prevents you. And this is, this is currently the, the most or the only exploited way for, for, for lawful interception who do not get permission to go to the base station. They set up a fake base station and they do a man in the middle attack. So they say, I'm the strongest base station. I don't support any encryption. So everyone talks to me in clear text and I just forward your calls and you don't know about that. Um, because there's, it's a one-way authentication. The mobile phone authenticates itself to the base station, but the base station does not 
authenticates yourself to the mobile phone. So you, as a mobile subscriber, you don't know if you're talking to a hostile base station or to the legitimate base station. Uh, what we just said there is when the fake base station doesn't activate uh, encryption, yeah. but for, for the uplink to the real base station, uh, yeah. I guess the real base station will require update, uh, encryption. No, no, it's not mandatory. So if the base station tells you, I support A5-1, and the mobile phone t uh, replies, oh, I don't support anything, and you're still allowed to, 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 to communicate. So if, so if, I have, if I would have a, a mobile phone which doesn't support the encryption, I still can register to the GSM network. That's right, yeah. But I guess it could be very easy. Are there phone calls which do not support the encryption? Are there, are there mobile phones which do not support the encryption? No, I don't know. The, the, I mean, the encryption algorithm is run on your SIM card, so it would depend on the SIM card. Maybe if you get a SIM card from some other country, you might find that they don't support encryption. There was actually a story in the newspaper a couple of months ago where they found out that um, if British people go to some country that they don't want to name, um, their mobile phone um, are not encrypted to make it for their law enforcement um, easier to intercept. So they go to a country somewhere so and base station out, oh, that's a yeah, of course. The user from the UK has a support uh, encryption. encryption, yeah, yeah, of course. So the base station says, oh, there's a foreign guy in my country. Probably my national security wants to sniff them what they're up to. Um, I just tell them, you know, be clear text. And then the phone is happily clear text. Actually, in the first version of the phones that came out, you had a little symbol at the top, a little lock that tells you when you have encryption or not. But it was demanded from the manufacturers to remove this lock so that it's not visible to the customer if he's encrypted or not. That's not correct. It depends on the phone. They exist. They exist again? Okay. That's great. You sound, uh, for example, I see you have this Nokia phone, the 6630. Um, you still see this lock when you do data calls, but you don't see it in voice calls. So when you connect your phone to, to a computer and you do an AT, DT, whatever, then you will see this lock again but um, not on voice calls. They removed it from the voice calls. Cool. Obviously, there's also software, the Nokia field monitor. You can verify if you have encryption or not. Anyone else? No questions? Well, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>